So what happens is if you want to optimize the growth of a business compared to its target market, so it's always relative to the market, you have to perfectly align the business with that market. And the reason companies don't realize their growth potential is because they are not quite aligned. Welcome to 7 to 8, our special series on 7 and 8 figure speakers. In this interview series, some of the hottest speakers in the industry who made over seven figures in a year or less will uncover their twists and turns in their adventures, helping you to avoid the potholes and stick to the fast track. Welcome now to center stage, our next guest speaker. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I'm super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Philippe. Philippe, thank you so much for being here with us today. You're welcome. It's a pleasure being on your show, and thank you for inviting me. Excellent. Give everybody the 5,000-foot view of who you are and what you love to do. Yeah, so I'm really fundamentally an entrepreneur at heart. I moved to Silicon Valley 33 years ago to start a software company, which I sold to our largest customer. Um, and then I worked for a very large organization. I worked for Hachette, one of the largest publishing companies in the world, helping them move into electronic publishing. I worked at Apple, where I studied and ran the Internet Commerce Group, uh, worked for Steve Jobs directly, which is how I lost my hair, in case you ever wondered. <laughs> no doubt. Built, built it from zero to 350 million, which is about $25 billion today. And um, and then I was a VC. I went to the dark side. I was a partner in uh, two venture firms, uh, focusing on seed and early stage investing. Yeah. Um, and... Um, and then I've been a management consultant for, I don't know, 14, 15 years now. And uh, I'm running a firm called Blue Dots, which is focused on revenue acceleration, you know, how to grow business faster. And that's what we do here at Blue Dots. I love it. So what made you pick business consulting as a thing to stick with? You know, it's interesting. I, I went through kind of two extremes. One is if you're an entrepreneur, you live very deep in that groove. Uh, you're focusing on, on, on what you do. You barely see the sky. Um, and, and, uh, I've done that. I paid my dues. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing that. It's really, really, really hard. And then on the other hand, you know, as a venture capitalist, you kind of invest, you sit on the board, but, um, you are not so much involved into the business from an operating standpoint. So I wanted to find a solution in between and being in management consulting is perfect because we give advice. Uh, it's, it's based on data and analysis that we do. Um, but I'm not running the company and I'm not responsible for the investors uh, for investing and making money. I'm really trying to advise the best we can, you know, the, those entrepreneurs and those CEOs and business leaders. I love it. So who would you say you serve and support most? Who is your like your ideal client the one you love to work with? Well, at Blue Dots, our ideal client are companies between 10 million and a billion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mentioned earlier to you, we have a $10 billion client right now. So it can go uh, it can go high, but um, we start at ten million, and the reason is they have to have enough data for us to analyze. We're very very data driven, it's a fact driven approach. Um, and if they are too small, they don't have the data. They don't have enough data. They don't quite know who they are, which is fine because you have to go through this adolescence phase as a company, and that's normal. Um, and then they tend to be too small, and they can't uh, really offer our fees. That's another reason why we don't do it. <laughs> I have heard that before. Well, and I, I, I tease and laugh lovingly. Um, so I just want to touch again on this, on this $10 million point, because I've said it time and time again, and people are like, why 10 million? I said, I don't know. There's just something that happens there that they, they grow and they change into something different. So in your experience, what is that difference? The delineator, you mentioned it's the data, but organizationally, what, yeah. what changes at that point? It's a really, really good question. Um, you can kind of hack your way into 10 million and build <laughs> it, you know, with what the CEO sells and there's no real processes and accountability. And that's, by the way, a good way. And most startups do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I, I would argue that is the way to do it. Um, if you want to grow from 10 to 100 million, which is the most difficult growth journey, in my opinion, mm -hmm. it's much harder to grow from 10 to 100 than 0 to 1 and 1 to 10. And then from 100 to a billion and a billion to 10 billion is easier. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to make sure that the Your first billion is always the hardest. I totally they get all, it. <laughs> they're, all, they're all really, really difficult. Um, if you want to grow from 10 million and above, you have to change the processes. You have to become disciplined. You have to track data and understand data and KPIs. 
uh, usually you have to change the management team because they were really good entrepreneurs, but you know they they are not um, trained or they don't know how to take it to a hundred million. So there is a real inflection point. Now we can argue whether it's five million or fifteen million. I don't know, but it's around that range, and um, and that's why. And I've I've observed many many companies get stuck at ten or twenty million and they never get to a hundred. And and part of the reason is they haven't retooled the entire processes and the entire company and the management team and the board. Um, and they are just stuck there and they stay forever, which breaks my heart because a lot of them have the potential to become a hundred million dollar business. But it's a real, you're right, it's a real inflection point and it's really hard. Well, and I've seen it that it's kind of at that C-suite level, typically like in those higher companies, they're very much treating it like a business. It's no longer their baby. They're not right. as emotionally involved in it. It's it's more of a business decision. And it's also repeatable systems, which yes. most entrepreneurs and founders go like, okay, I'm bored. We've been doing the same thing for five years. Yeah. It's like, yes, and we plan on doing that for 20. <laughs> it's like, yeah. If we could keep that forever, we would. And that's just not their game anymore. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and um, mm-hmm. you know, you also need to create that flywheel in terms of sales and, and marketing. And and a lot of entrepreneurs just don't know how to do that, do that, or they are not interested in doing that for the reasons you just mentioned. That's very true. Awesome. So when you're working with your companies, what is your your processes that you're taking them through. So say you have somebody that's at that kind of $20 million mark, they're stuck and they're going, Philippe, what do I do? Well, I know the answer. I always know the answer and it's always the same and it can be captured in one single word. It's misalignment. So what happens is if you want to optimize the growth of a business compared to its target market, so it's always relative to the market, you have to perfectly align the business with that market. And the reason companies don't realize the growth potential is because they are not quite aligned. Now, the question is, well, what does it mean and where am I misaligned and what can I do about it, which is which is the right question to ask. Um, interestingly, there are four universal axes of alignment. So you can take any business. I can take a cafe on the left bank in Paris. I can take a startup here in Silicon Valley, small company in Miami or Fortune 500 company in the heart of Manhattan. Those four alignments are exactly the same. And I'm going to tell you very quickly what they are. The first one is that the pain of the customer and the claim that the business makes to address that pain have to be aligned. So, Michelle, if you have a headache and you come to me and I give you a stomachache pill where your pain and my claim, which is to address stomachache issues, are not aligned, you will never buy my pill and you shouldn't. That's the first axis of alignment. The second one is that the perception, which is the understanding of the claim, And the message, which is the expression of that claim, must be aligned. So the perception is how you understand my claim as a prospect. And my message is how I express, how I tell you my claim have to be aligned. So imagine I have a pill for your headache and it costs 99 cents. And let's say I describe it to you in Korean. I'm assuming you don't speak Korean. You will never buy a pill because you're like, what the heck is this guy talking about? And you shouldn't because you don't understand what I'm talking about. So you will never buy the pill, even though it would be the perfect pill for your headache. So that's the second axis. The third one is the way customers want to buy and the way the business sells in the marketplace have to be aligned. So if I said, Michelle, I know you're in Calgary. And I said, well, what? I have the pill for you, but you have to fly here to the Bay Area where I am in Palo Alto or San Francisco. To get my pill, you're going you're gonna to tell me, well, what do I mean? There's a pharmacy down the street from where I am. Why can't I just walk there and buy the pill? That's the third axis. And then the fourth axis is my favorite one called, I have to confess, I stole it out of the Apple playbook. So as I work directly for Steve Jobs, there are three really interesting lessons I learned that have served me so well over the years, and I, I still use it every day. And, and one of the lessons is that I realized that there is one and only one single business on this planet. So... You know, American Airlines, Tesla, or, you know, a cafe down the street, everybody's in the same business. And that unique business is the manufacturing and delivery of the light. That's the business everyone is in. And if an entrepreneur doesn't understand that, I can guarantee you he or she will not grow the business. So you have to manufacture and you have to deliver the light. And what happens is when I buy a product or a service, I have a certain delight expectation as I consume that product or service, that expectation must be met. So imagine now I give you the pill, you swallow it, and after 10 minutes, your headache is worse, and you have a rash on your skin, and you feel dizzy. Well, 
clearly that's not what you expected. You expected that your headache will be gone in 10 minutes and then you will go on with your daily routine. That's the fourth axis of alignment. So I can look at any business. And by the way, it doesn't matter how big or small it is. If an entrepreneur has an idea and hasn't even and has, has not developed the product or launched the product or any revenue, they should look at those four answers very, very seriously. And it's like, is the claim that I'm making to my target market aligned with their pain? Do I understand what their pain is? Do I understand my claim? Is the articulation of my claim, which is my messaging, aligned with the percept with their perception of what I'm doing? Is the way I sell aligned with the way they really want to buy? And finally, what expected delight do I share with them? And I need to make sure that as I deliver my product or service, that delight expectation is, is met. And if you do this, and there's no other axis, but if you do those four axes of alignment, your business will grow as fast as you can within your target market. And so our methodology to answer your question, and I, I apologize, I realized I gave a long answer. Uh, we measure coefficients of alignment from zero to 100% along each of those four axes through tools that we've developed and some IP. And then by measuring, we can actually unearth and we understand the insights and where exactly the company is misaligned and why. And then we can put together a growth playbook, which is a list of actions that the company should take to rectify those misalignment and then they can grow faster and then they can create more and more value. And that's at a very high level how we do things. Nice, I love it. Well, and it feeds into what we have been professing is the thing that will make, will get people over a million dollars is more often than not, they don't express the pain. They're still doing push marketing. They're still trying to get their word out as opposed to figuring out what the clientele wants. And yeah. and they're just not saying in a way that's that's clean and articulate. Yeah. And I see that the the last two issues that you bring up, um, to me on the outsource on the outside, I see entrepreneurs going, "Oh, I can be really creative with this, but I lack money." And if they have the venture capitalism coming in at that point, they can expand on those things. But are there other things that are stopping them from being able to fulfill on those? To, yes. So I said there's four axis of alignment. In really, this four plus one. The four axes of alignment I described are is the alignment between the business and its target market. The fifth axis, which is what we call the internal alignment, it's very clear that if the team is not aligned internally, they will not be able to execute and and you know the market growth because of the four external alignment. They just can't do it. So the ability to execute and be aligned as a team is really critical to be successful. But I do believe that you can look at the internal alignment only after you understand the four axis of alignment because you may not have the right talent or the right resources or the right process or the right or the money to do it. And that's why you cannot wake up in the morning and say, well, is my team aligned? That's not the right question. The right question is, is my, my team aligned to execute the four external alignment? And that's really critical. Love that. So would you say that in your experience, the first two are particularly kind of marketing issues and the others are kind of sales and operational issues or is it a team game? How does that work? Yeah, I, I, that's a question that we are asked often. Um, I, I try, if you try to map the current way typical companies are organized with those with this framework, you will realize that the pain and the claim is really about the product and understanding the target market. The messaging and the perception is really marketing. And then go to market and sales is really the uh, sales versus purchase alignment. And then the last one is kind of unclear where it sits. So if I were to start a business from scratch today, I would forget about the traditional way companies are organized. I would organize my company into those six segments. You know, one team is focusing on the pain and the claim. The next team is focusing on the message and the perception and all that, because that's the journey that a prospect takes all the way from, you know, I have the pain all the way to, I use the product and I want to dispose of your product if you go there. Um, and I don't know any company who is organized this way, but that's the way I would do it if I were to start from scratch. Thanks, love that. And it's been my experience that oftentimes sales knows what the pain of the client is, 
marketing is the one trying to create the messaging around it and ne'er shall the two talk to each other until somebody like you <laughs> and go okay you need systems to be able to make communication happen here so well do we have three hours together because <laughs> exactly. i can tell you that the misalignment between sales and marketing and what we call RevOps, you know revenue operations um which is a separate group um is very very high many many companies are misaligned and i think the fundamental issue is that there is no common definition of a lead or a qualified lead and then there is no um there is no agreement between sales and marketing what i call sla um which is the service level agreement and there is a misunderstanding so marketing goes to sell and says well i give you a thousand leads and you haven't sold anything what's wrong with you and then sales goes to marketing and says, well, of course, I'm not selling all the leads you give me are crap. And so you have this tension. And the fundamental reason, again, is because there is no clear understanding of what constitute, constitutes a good lead, a qualified lead. Um, and, and that's something we see pretty much every day in pretty much every organization. So you're absolutely right. This is a fundamental misalignment that we see all the time. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'm I'm glad we're not in a silo of business, but at the well, same time, way, it's I, kind I, of I, funny. I can also tell you that we work with a billion or several billion dollar revenue companies. They have the same problem mm -hmm. than a two million dollar company that's trying to get it to ten. And, you know, we see that. I'm always impressed by how much this misalignment exists, even in very mature organizations and large organizations. It's pretty mind boggling. Wow, and. Why would you say that that happens? I know that in kind of in the hundred thousands to the millions, it's usually because they've got this kind of slapstick software systems put together, what I call Frankenware. Yeah. And it just kind of breaks apart. Do you find that that's happening at the higher levels too? Yeah, that, that's one reason. So that that's kind of on a tooling side or, or the tools. Um, you know, they have a salesforce.com product and then they have a HubSpot, which is a marketing, you know, uh, uh, software and there's no bi-directional talking. There is no clear definition of what the attributes of the data we want to track is. Um, it, it's a very um, disjoint system, siloed system. You know, um, I, I like the word that you use because that, that's exactly what it is. So that could be one reason. The other reason could be that there is no clear understanding of precision segmentation, market precision segmentation. In other words, there is not a clear view of what the ideal customer profile should be and therefore everybody goes after different and also marketing people want to qualify everybody it's like hey if you talk to me and you're smiling you're probably you should buy my product well i'm selling nuclear plants i'm pretty sure that you will not buy my nuclear plant today right michelle <laughs> so what happens are. If once they engage into a conversation with the prospect somehow they convince themselves that that prospect is a good prospect and they will buy and in most cases they won't uh, there is that, so there's many many reasons. Another reason could be that they don't disqualify the prospect fast enough. We push our clients to say, "You'd better have a no very quickly." That uh, maybe yes, which I know because I can look at it. This guy will never buy. It's like why do you waste your time and bang your head against that wall? And so, in in some cases, we even compensate the sales uh, people by the speed of dequalification, which is very counterintuitive but very effective. And then another reason, so there could be many, many reasons. Another reason would be sales compensation is not aligned with their behavior. In other words, they behave in a way that they will maximize their compensation as salespeople and as human beings, and that's fine. But the problem is that the behavior hasn't been really understood and compensation dictates behavior as opposed to go to market should dictate the behavior, which is then you design your compensation plan around the behavior that you expect and not the other way. And there's many, many other reasons. Right. I, I'm loving this and I can totally see that I could, you know, we could have this conversation for three days ongoing, but I promise I won't. So just because it struck me, do you tend to take into account psychographics in your sales at that point? Because my understanding of B2B at that level would be, well, I guess that would be B2B. Um, if you had a company like Coca-Cola, obviously they're going to take into account psychographics, but mm -hmm. B2B is at that level. Would they also taking that into account i uh, probably not i mean it could but it depends okay. so really the way you the attributes that you decide to put on a prospect defines the person segmentation so for example 
I could observe that most of my customers are women between, you know, 30 and 45 years old who have a dog and they have a blue eye, blue eyes. And I do that because I'm doing the analysis of all the customers that I have today. And I realize that that's the case. Then that will dictate the profile that I want to go after. And that's a good way to do it. The other good, the other way to do it is you segment, you, you have a base model that you think is right. And then you start to go after each segment and then you see which one are working and which one are not working. And then you feed that back into your the profile and to the definition of a good prospect. Right. Love it. It could happen. I, mm -hmm. Maybe you use the demographics the information, uh, socioeconomics information. It really depends on your business and your target customers. I, yeah, I assume that somebody buying a nuclear power plant is going to be substantial. Right. I'm not going to really care about that. That's right. <laughs> no. Uh, that's kind of funny. Like, uh, would there really be a difference in psychographics between somebody buying a nuclear um, power plant and somebody buying a dam? Probably not, I would guess. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but, but you're asking a quite, the right question, which is what attributes really matter for us to be successful in our go-to-market strategy? And I think that's a profoundly important uh, uh, question. Nice. Well, I'm again, I'm loving it now and could spend all day here. So is there anything that you see as being kind of paramount for somebody of that size business? Now, I'm assuming that most people of that size business are already going to have experience with venture capitalism to get them to that point. Um, but so other than kind of going for um, kind of private money or even public money, is there a difference in that arena of the problems that they're solving and, and kind of what they're going for outside of obviously what we've talked about? In terms of funding, you mean? Um, well, in terms of the growth for it, like, do they oh. need to have, um, can they bootstrap it at a billion dollars or do they have yeah, to? Have... I mean, well, if you're a billion dollar, you should be profitable at that level. Otherwise, yeah. you have a problem. And, you know, the question is, how much of that profit do, you, do I put into the growth engine, right? How much do I invest in growth? And I would say you should invest as much as you can, unless you're a publicly traded company, but because then you have all kinds of other expectations to manage at the wall at Wall Street. Um, but the problem is not the the problem is, you know, where I am am I mature enough as a billion dollar business to understand really the levers and what makes the company grow. And if the answer is no, then you have a problem. If the answer is yes, then it's pretty obvious where you should put your money and and right. have a I was just thinking somebody like, you know, um, Amazon, say hypothetically, a logistics company came along and they had a better system of of transporting things than Amazon does. I mean, granted, Amazon has moved logistics <laughs> up, you know, you know faster, it. better than anybody else ever right. has. But if they did that and they went, oh, OK, we need to acquire them, but it's it's almost not feasible, but we have to in order to lower the costs in the end. You mean Amazon would have to acquire those guys? Yeah. Yeah, I mean- I'm assuming that'd that. be pretty easy, but- Yeah, they would do that. So if somebody, if a startup in Silicon Valley comes with a drone idea that you can transport packages in a safe way that's FAA approved and so on and so forth, Amazon is not going to say, well, I'm going to start developing this idea from scratch. This company right. may be a 10-year-old company that has been doing this for a long time. In that case, they would put a billion dollars or half a billion dollars on the table and they would acquire them. And that would boost- their growth, but also give them a competitive edge because now they own that company. Nobody else does. Yeah. So, so M and A and an acquisition, you know, merger and acquisition as a mechanism to grow makes sense as long as there's a good alignment and and a really good thoughtful process to determine which company to acquire and then integrate them into the business because that's that's hard as well. Well, and I assume that that would be one of the biggest areas that you would go into a company is after merger and acquisition because. It has not been my experience where anybody's in alignment <laughs> after that happens. Yeah, although Apple, I could argue Apple, apart from Beats, which was a big acquisition, probably the biggest, Apple has never really acquired large companies. They Apple acquires talent and developers, um, and they pay top money for that, but they don't buy big companies. I know Steve Steve Jobs would not, you know, would not was not in favor of buying big companies because you're bringing a culture that's different than ours, and that's really hard to integrate. Absolutely. So what are some of the struggling points that somebody would be having and they're going, oh my God, Felipe, we need you so badly in here? Well, it's because they're not growing as fast as they want. Okay. They know there is growth potential. 
uh, they are not going as fast, they are not executing their growth plan, or their competition suddenly is going a lot faster than they are, and they are losing market share. Um, those are the typical situations where we get called by the CEO and he says, you know, I, I want to grow. I'm not quite sure what's going on. I need help. And then we come in and we use our methodology and our team and we help them. We put together a growth playbook and we and we help them execute that and be successful. Love it. So give us an example of one of your Cinderella stories of one of your clients, if you can. Well, we had a company that um, it, it's, it's, it's along the second axis, which is the message versus the perception. We had a company that went in, that was in the business of delivering food for busy employees. So imagine you're in a meeting, there's 12 people on the table, it's noon, everybody's hungry. And you're like, well, we, I'd like to finish the meeting. I don't want everybody to jump on a car, go in a restaurant and we'll regroup in an hour and a half. It's a waste of time. So this company, you, you go on a website, you order for everybody and they bring and they deliver, they prepare and they deliver the food to you, to, to the team. So they were focusing on businesses only. And... One of the things that the CEO was very obsessed about preparing uh, meals that were healthy. So she was obsessed about making sure that, you know, you eat healthy meals, but also that everything is environmental friendly. So there was no plastic. Everything was recyclable. It was very well thought out. And we started to talk to customers and we said, well, what's your pay point? And they were explaining to us. And we said, well, why, why did you buy this? Because there's 20 other companies doing the same thing. I said, well, we bought this because... Um, it's it's um, it's good for the planet and it's good for us as human beings because the food is uh, very well prepared. They had the company had a nutritionist. They were really careful in terms of making sure that it was balanced and there was fiber and and not too many calories and so on and so forth. Wow. So we went back to the company and and I told the CEO I said you are not in the business of preparing food for busy employees. I know that's what you told me, but that's not your business. And she was like, well, I don't understand. What's my business? I said. Your business is to make people healthier. Now I can go back to my wife and can, I can say, yes, I had lunch today at the company and it was a healthy meal, which very few employees can claim today. And, and, and by the way, I'm also happier as an employee because I eat healthy, but I also save the planet. I contribute a little bit in saving the planet and I'm actually willing to pay more for that. So we completely reposition the business and we would tell, we would sell to HR and we say, you know, you have 2,000 employees in this, in those buildings around. We want to deliver food. It's going to be healthier for them. So HR was helping setting up the program. And we would print the list of all our competitors. There was maybe 12 or 14 competitors. And we would tell the head of HR, by the way, if, they, if you want your employees to eat greasy food that they're going to have a hard time to digest and that's unhealthy, those 12 companies are really perfect for that. That's not who we are, but you should buy from them. So we would actually literally print the list of all our competitors and tell the CEO or the head of HR to buy from them if they wanted to continue to destroy the planet and if they wanted their employees to eat unhealthy food. And we were able, because of the value, so the real pain wasn't I need to eat now because I'm in a meeting. The, the real pain was I need to eat fast for sure, that was table stakes, but I also want to eat healthy and I want to contribute to saving the planet. And because of that pain that we better understood by talking to customers, we were able to increase pricing by like 18%. There was a tolerance to pay more because it was healthier and it was saving the planet. And so we increased pricing by 18%. The company got 80% increase directly to the bottom line right away. And that's because we were able to uniquely position the company. And we knew that none of our competitors could make that claim because it wasn't healthy and it wasn't particularly good for the planet. So that's an example of completely changing the positioning and the messaging to our advantage. And really, and we got 20% growth right away nice. without, do, without doing much. We just changed the pricing. That's all we did. <laughs> Love it. So I know our listeners are going to want more from you. How did they start their journey with you? Well, they could go, first of all, I, I wrote a book on this, which is called Aligning the Dots, and they can find it on Amazon. Um, and they can go on aligningthedots.com that will direct them to my personal website. But if they want to check out Blue Dots, our, our website is bluedotspartners.com with an S at the end of dots and at the end of partners as well. So bluedotspartners.com. And then I always invite people to connect with me on LinkedIn at Philippe Buissou, B as in boy, O-U-I-S-S-O-U. And I'd be happy to talk to any CEOs and entrepreneurs and business leaders who want to grow faster. I love it. And peeps, we will, of course, have all of Philippe's links in, show, in the show notes. So just scroll down and you'll find access to those. 
So Philippe, at this point, I get to ask you, at what point in life did you know that you were a special kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? You know, I think I was born entrepreneur. I always, I always like the process of transforming an idea. And it doesn't matter how crazy or simple or difficult the idea is, transforming that into a real business, you know, a business that generates at least $10 million or $100 million business. Um, a real business this process this process <laughs> but you know I, I was a physicist i i studied chaos theory i have a phd there and i decided not to get into physics precisely because i wanted to understand this transformation process from an id in somebody's crazy brain into a real business where customer buy and translate and, and transact and and consume and that's the process that i've been always fascinating about Okay, about. now I have to ask you because you opened it up. So have you seen any parallels between chaos theory and entrepreneurialism? Yes, there's no difference. The same thing. <laughs> I use it every day. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I love it. I love it. You have been absolutely awesome. Please, any last words Thank for our you. people? Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure to be on your show and I wish you and all your listeners, you know, the best of luck. And again, they shouldn't hesitate to contact me if I can help in any way. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I know how valuable it is. Thank you. Peeps, this is Michelle Nedlock. Thank you for being here with us. Be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your friends. We love helping entrepreneurs grow. Thank you for listening to 7 to 8. If you're interested in upping your speaking game, be sure to connect with our guests with the links in the show notes and connect with me to see how we can help you get your tech done for you and help your speaking dreams come true.